The Ukrainian language is beautiful and it's under threat tonight. There's a war going on and I would like to write a letter to the future in case far more terrible things happen and in case things continue to happen they lead to things that we don't want to happen or think about. My name is Ben Schwellen. Today I want to speak to the future and tell you about the past so that something as bad as language death does not happen. We're talking about the future. What could happen to the Ukrainian language and why does that matter? First of all, we have to look at how Russia views the Ukrainian language historically and what the Ukrainian language is historically to take another view because in the distant past the Ukrainian language emerged in a very different position to Russian rather than out of the same thing as some would like to imagine for political gain and politics in terms of languages around the world and in history are very interrelated so you have Kyiv, the capital of Ukraine, and this is a cradle of the Kievan Rus, an ecclesiastical center of Orthodox Christianity, which for over a thousand years, well over that and more, has shaped Eastern Europe, its centers of learning, political and economic influence spreading over into the Carpathians, up into Poland, and certainly up into the rivers of Russia. But when Kyiv was founded, Moscow was nothing really more than a few mud huts above the river Volga. And this may perhaps give a bit of resentment for Putin because he considers his language, Russian, to be a cradle of Slavic civilization. But the cradle of that Slavic civilization is not in Russia, which psychologically would be a political wound to think that another language could have spawned your civilization. And so when the Russian Empire expanded, certainly under Peter the Great in the, I'll put his reign here, so on the edge of the 18th century, and his title was ruler of all Russia, and he absorbed what would be much of the Ukrainian lands and enacted harsh laws upon the Ukrainian language and from this point certainly the Ukrainian language finds itself under attack because the Russians want that port on the Black Sea such as those as beautiful Odessa certainly the Crimea which came to action later on from 1807 all the way up until the revolution, the days after 1917, this is 110 years and more, the Ukrainian language was banned from most all institutions, basically schools across Russia. Certainly in Ukraine it was not allowed except for some small western bits which were not under Russian rule. And the purpose of this was unification, creating one Russian people. They even tried to get rid of Ukrainian letters because you didn't have that in Russian, so you won't need that anymore, will you? And you see this throughout history. What is happening right now, what it can lead to. The Egyptian language has been lost. The treasures we could have kept in the Egyptian language to Arabic. It was not an overnight sweeping into the Nile and taking it out. No, people in the countryside of Egypt were speaking Egyptian. The Egyptian language well into probably the 1700s at least. You have the Gaulish language, which is what would have become a sister language to Welsh. This was pushed out. That language of Gaulish has been lost. You see this over and over in history, invading a country and slowly over the years, decades, and sometimes centuries that follow the language being pushed out and a new prestige 
language being put in. You saw it with Dacian, which became Romanian, as it was Latinized and the people removed from their heritage. And you see this over and over again through history. Losing a language. Over a million people speak Nahuatl, the Aztec language, in Mexico. And yet, Mexico identifies with Spanish. It's that prestige being in place upon it again. And it was for unity, and it's for unity that Putin is invading Ukraine. And language itself is being manipulated the denazification of Ukraine when its president is a Jewish man and Holocaust memorials have been attacked. You see the weaponization of languages between languages. Within a language, words become capable of a new meaning. It's not just belonging to the kleptocratic right as we see in Russian towards Ukrainian today. We see it happening in America, the shifting of language to convey political agenda meanings on the radical left. Race takes on more meanings than just race. Anti-racism, a word seemingly innocent, becomes a form of racism and it goes on and on. Critical no longer means critical, it means thinking in the correct way to be assimilated by and to show that you are within a community of those who are accepted as using the right kind of language. And my warning to the future is, do not let the Ukrainian language be lost. It is a jewel, a treasure trove, as equal to Egyptian or Gaulish. The Uyghur language is being lost as we speak in China, Xi Jinping is attacking the Uyghurs because there's a lot of historical residue there. Genghis Khan, the Mongol, who created the Khan, and he established his empire and he said that, or he decreed that the Uyghur script would be that which they wrote the Mongol language in. And this was imposed upon the Chinese throughout the 13th century and it began to replace Chinese and push it out of use in many places from the north and northwest. And the Chinese, especially the nationalists, never forgot that. And so the Uyghur genocide can be seen as a, a recollection of historical cultural threat. And what Putin's doing in Ukraine could lead to the loss of the Ukrainian language in the centuries to come if we are not careful. And we must not let that happen. Do not let a culture be wiped out. I invite you to go learn this language, the Ukrainian language, as a protest. Learn Ukrainian as a protest against this invasion to show not solidarity, that's just an identity badge so often that you belong to a, a group but rather as a, an acknowledgement that we're not going to simply let cultures be washed out by violence anymore or pushed out by the prestige of another imposed upon it. This language is wholly different to Russian and the Russians have already begun to use terminology which suggests they're going to treat it like a dialect of Russian, as a patois as after the French Revolution was done to, for lack of a better word, exterminate the native languages of France and set Parisian French down upon them. Ukrainian has a whole host of words which come from other sources that are not Russian. Tamada, it's a toastmaster. It's from Georgian, the Georgian language, which is not Indo-European. A Toastmaster is a, a master of ceremonies, announcements. And the Turkic language gave Ukrainian kavun, which is a watermelon. The Lithuanian language was quite extensively used, spread across Ukraine. It was a, a very dominant. It was the largest country in Europe for a while, Lithuania along with Poland. And the Lithuanian language influenced Ukrainian in ways. Get Yantar is the word for amber, the substance. 
Lithuanian amber is, well, the most of it in the world comes from that region and that little enclave controlled by Russia on the Baltic Sea. It's no coincidence that it's rich in amber and that Russia controls it. From its rich Jewish tradition, you get words like geshift. From Yiddish, meaning a speculative business deal, you get words from German, ancient Scythian, extinct languages which have influenced upon Ukrainian, showing the age of this language. Along with Lithuanian ruling over large parts of Ukraine, what would become Ukraine, you had Polish as well. Polish left a deep lasting influence and the lexical similarity between Polish and Ukrainian is actually higher than that with Ukrainian and Russian. You get words from Polish like gwint, which is a, a screw fastener. I guess that's a type of screwdriver. Poshta, uh, post or the post or the mail you would say in America or post office. So there's, and there's words coming through Polish that are further west in influence from German that you don't get in Russian. There's a lot of influences that reach Ukraine from the edge of the central European sphere of languages that don't quite go further east into Russian. Also from Polish, sesja, which is a meeting of a legislative body. Um, we might say a, a session of court in English. You could say that too. That would be a, a, a rough cognate equivalent. And so the influences upon Ukrainian are very different to Russian. And my message to the future is, keep teaching this language, keep learning it, keep giving it to your children. Don't give up. Because the Ukrainians have had to fight for centuries to keep this language and culture going. And that fight, that tenacity has made it very rich. It would be a shame to lose like we have lost so many others. And surely the time in human history of losing our treasure troves of cultural gems that are human languages, surely that should be over states, countries, or even regional parliaments or parliaments within nations that are not states. These are so important to preserve cultural identity and linguistic, not purity, but linguistic communities, not in terms of identity versus identity, but in terms of the value culturally and in our humanity that each one gives us. Because what could happen in the future is that it's going to come up and say we're going to get a dialectic kind of one against the other pitting the Russian language against the Ukrainian saying that they are the nationalists you see how it's turning words around and words very soon are going to be used against Ukrainians in a new way as we're seeing in different groups around the world in terms of identity weaponizing language, words coming to have more than one meaning depending upon who you're speaking to or who you're speaking with. And so nationalist is coming to replace patriotism. Being against war is becoming violence. And for instance, the peace symbol, the symbol is now banned in Russia and words become weapons and languages become weaponized. And we can stop this. And if we're not able to stop it, we must pass on the message to our children, and especially to Ukrainian children. Your language is valuable. We want you to carry it on, and we want you to give it to other people to experience the richness of this culture so that we do not lose it like we have the Egyptian language, the Carthaginian language, the Ligurian language, the Gaulish language, the Pictish language, so many Native American languages, sadly. And the Ukrainian story does not have to be sad. Those historical roots of etymology, which I just showed you a few words of, we can continue to have that. You can continue to evolve and suck new words into your language to bloom new fruits in your culture. We want you to, and we don't have to let it happen again. 
Слава Україні! Слава!